All right, thanks. Can you uh, do you have this the uh, screen on correctly here, Randy? Is it showing the right screen there? Yep, it looks great. Perfect. Thank you. And um, thanks again, Alex and uh, Walker, for the uh, nice segue into this talk. Uh, this this talk actually started off as a spring training seminar I did for our office here. It's a topic I've I've been interested in ever since I was a little kid that a tornado went through my backyard and I got to go look at the damage. And the <clears throat> the impetus for for talking about storm surveying is it's really for two aspects. One, it really helps us get out there in the field as meteorologists and interact with those who got to who were inter, who were impacted by the event and also were the receivers of our information. And secondly, it's the backbone for improving our convective science services and our decision support services. So it all ties together where quality storm surveying really helps build the foundation for improving our services. And again, this was a, a training topic. It'll kind of read like a training topic. I'll gloss over a few things that hopefully we're all familiar with. Uh, it's broken down into four main components, starting with the preparation and then the conducting of a ground survey, finishing up with the wrap up work back at the office for sending that data out to the media and our partners in the public. And then finally transitioning to probably my favorite aspect with the aerial and virtual survey techniques. And for those of you who have been around the block a few times here at the Weather Service, you know that storm surveying is not what it was 20 years ago. Uh, back then you might be able to piece together a tornado based on some news clips, a couple of VHS tapes sent to the office, maybe some paper maps drawn from a, from a damage survey. And if you were really, really lucky, you got to get a, a Civil Air Patrol flight over the damage path. And in this instance, this picture in the bottom right is rather ominous. It has three tornado tracks converging on this one little poor spot in this farm field. And when all was said and done, you still had to put it into storm data. And storm data, even to this day, is still lacking, where you, all you have to put in for data is a beginning point and an end point. And in this instance, it doesn't even come close to capturing the true complexity of a tornado track highlighted out here in the red. The types of surveys we do primarily, almost exclusively, are ground surveys at the Weather Service. And they're the best for determining EF ratings. But for those of you who have been out on these, you know that they're very limited by the road networks and the damage indicators out there to hit. Um, other survey techniques, aerial surveys, we've had Civil Air Patrol flights for the last 70 years, but really the last five to 10 years with high resolution satellites and UAVs coming online, it's just really been a game changer for us and can help fill in the gaps for these surveys. And then finally, there's the virtual surveys, which is basically using pictures of the tornado or damage to piece together what happened and probably is best reserved for the weak events or those with limited DIs. Um, but the best surveys really utilize all three of these sources. Um, I'm not going to say one is better than the other. They all have their pros. They all have their cons. But really leveraging all three really is the way to do it. And we'll now shift over to storm survey prep. Hopefully you're all pretty familiar with this, so I won't spend too much time here. For us here at Topeka, storm surveys have been required for EF2 damage or greater, greater with depths, large, large uh, media coverage, or an EM request and basically optional for everything else. And when it comes to storm surveys, um, if you're unable to conduct them, you can always call in a neighboring WFO for help or just rely on the aerial or virtual survey techniques as well. But again, they have their lacking and it's really hard to assign EF ratings based off of these two types of survey techniques alone. In the pre-COVID era, we would assign survey teams of at least two people if possible. And then again, assign, decide, determine if we needed to do multiple teams for more complex events. And we have a staff roster here where we can assign a senior surveyor with, with a more or less experienced surveyor to help them um, go out in the field. And when it comes to team members, expect to be out there early and, and arrive and come back late. It's gonna be a long day with the weather service furnishing the various safety and documentation gear that you're going to be able to use out in the field with team members furnishing the appropriate clothing, and then really just remembering some of the nuances, you know, bringing sunglasses or a coat if it's gonna be 40 degrees and windy after the storm. Sunscreen, you know, you're gonna be out there in the field a long day. Things that you might not initially think about come into play really later on. We should be contacting our emergency managers after an event, uh, not only to inform them of our survey intentions, but also they can help us out and in providing us additional damage information 
and also giving us access to damaged areas that we might not be able to get into as easily. And nowadays, a lot of our EMs have uh, UAVs, and so we can tap them as a great resource to, to utilize those, those platforms for our surveying. After all that's done, the PIO back at the office in the office should be constructing media talking points for the event, and then using either archived AWIPS or GR data, constructing damage paths using the AWIPS damage path tool or directly in the damage assessment toolkit. And it's never a bad idea to provide these digitally and as well as in a printout for the survey teams. And this is just some pictures of sketching. You can just sketch the tracks directly in the DAT using the line tool and just not publishing it to the, to the public server. Or you can just use the AOPS damage path tool in the bottom right here and then export that to the data as well. And these tracks will be visible to those using the, the damage assessment toolkit on iPads. When you put it in landscape mode, you can actually then see these tracks and, and see your position relative to the tracks. It's quite handy. But I always have a soft spot for paper maps and I'll still usually at least print out a track map for the survey team or draw my own. And this is just an example of me drawing my own um, from a survey about five years ago. And so I always have a soft spot for paper. Uh, once you get approval, uh, satellite imagery should be ordered as soon as possible. Ideally, the night after the event, if it's during the evening, that night, try to order the satellite data from the USGS server there. I have the link there. And the full instructions are on the Central Region Emergency Rock page. Uh, one note I would say when it comes to ordering satellite data, draw as small of a polygon in the map as possible because that will increase your chances of a successful satellite pass because these satellite images are very large in terms of data, but their footprint's relatively small. So to draw the smaller polygon will make their job easier to capture the track. And typically satellite data will arrive in about one to two weeks. It's not gonna be available the next day. So that's why I say get it in as soon as possible because it will take so long as well. And then finally at the end, release a statement for the, uh, for the media to use and our, uh, notify the ROC as well about our survey intentions. Upon departure from the office, the survey team should have a number of different items. The biggest ones of course nowadays being the iPads and believe me, battery backups are a must these days. Uh, the maps I talked about earlier, uh, the contact info for the EM, so you can contact them on the way to the damage site in case they have any updated information for you. The protective gear, we have an EF scale kit binder that we can use as a reference, as a backup um, as well. When it comes to damage triaging, uh, different tactics can be used to catalog the damage as best as possible. And this really depends on the event. Uh, and there's no one set way to do this properly. You can start for just a single track surveying from end to end, from one point to the other. You can start at the worst of the damage and then work your way out to the ends. Or if it's a very large and complex track, you can have multiple teams working on the track and then sketching the, and then stitching the track together after all that's done. For multiple tracks, it's kind of the same way. You can survey tracks in sequential order from the distance from the office. You can start with the most severe track and then work your way down based on impacts, or if you have multiple teams, you can break them up as needed or as you see fit. So you're on the ground survey team, you come across the tornado damage, and now what do you do? Uh, the first and foremost thing is to be safe out there. No matter the scale or the scope of the tornado, whether or not it just downed a few trees or it took out an entire city, there's going to be dangers that exist. Uh, beware of sharp objects, make sure you're wearing very thick boots, uh, hazardous materials may exist, and of course, compromised structures. We never recommend going into any structure that might be compromised. At a given damage point, start with the worst damage and then work outwards from there. And the biggest point I'd probably hit is be thorough. Um, a lot of times, unfortunately, our media partners expect us to have the entire results of the survey done within a day. But physically, that's not often, oftentimes not possible. And I would say, I've heard this before reiterated by another person, but treat it like a NTSB crash scene that the experts will take days, even sometimes weeks to come to a conclusion of what happened. And sometimes we have to be like that with tornadoes to accurately document what truly happened. And often, and again, with uh, storm surveying, when it comes to having the mindset up there, have an open mind and let the science drive the results and weigh all the evidence you have at your disposal, not just from the survey, but radar data, the environment, what you had for storm reports, and even leveraging uh, subject matter experts to arrive at the best conclusion possible. And I stress, don't let any non-scientific pressures get in the way 
of of your of your survey and some of the ones you can think of right off the top of your head are verification scores or even outside opinions from someone who said well i had this damage therefore it had to be a tornado that's you're the expert you're the one that's out there to determine that and that's your to yours to decide and be willing to adjust the results of a storm survey don't just go out there the first day and think that's the way it is and then the book is closed that's never the case with mother nature as we've learned time and time again that there's so much complexity when it comes to a survey and what the storm did and new data can be uncovered months after an event and be willing to adjust that as the day as the need is need sees fit and a great example i always like to show here is this image from one of my, fa my favorite event august 31st 2014 in central iowa after a qlcs rolled through speaking of qlcs's and the day after the event, we had zero tornadoes reported. And that's the way it was for a while. And finally, after an aerial survey, we discovered, oh crap, there were 34 tornadoes. And actually there were more damage passed than that, that we had to sift through and say, maybe these weren't tornadoes. Um, so that's just an example of ways to adjust the survey and be having an open mind for storm surveys. However, after the first day of the survey, these are kind of the big things to try and try and wrap up here for, for uh, releasing to the media. Of course, if you're trying to determine if it's a tornado or not, that'd be nice. Uh, the max EF rating, the rough start and end point times, the length, and then the rough maximum track width. Track width. And if you don't feel comfortable with these results and you have the time, try to go out there and do an additional survey. There's times that you have to do three or four surveys of a tornado to really get it right. And then from all of that, hopefully use the data to construct the GIS track either during, either at, right after the survey or at a later date. And when you're out there doing a survey, professionalism is a must. Um, and make sure that there's no mistake and you're from the Weather Service. And be sure to show respect to property owners when you're out there and get permission to be out there. They're gonna love to tell stories. I've, been, I've once been held up by a property owner for over an hour as she tried telling me the whole story of her life in this tornado. And you know, it's good to listen. It's, that's why it's good to also have a second person there to help move things along if you get caught up in those. But stories really do establish a connection when it comes to surveying. And during the training, I was gonna ask people about you know, what caused these, this damage here across in these various pictures. You see some grain bins damage, some houses missing their roofs or walls. And then this very interesting picture here in the bottom left where you see this path through the fields. And the, the results were, uh, Quite, aren't quite as uh, amazing as they as they uh, should have been. This was actually the previous derecho to hit Iowa. All these pictures are from the same event. They're all from damaging downburst winds. They're, none of them are from tornadoes. The image here actually in the bottom left is actually a grain bin that was rolled from the wind. You can see it way off there in the distance, but that's actually not a tornado path. That's just the corn flattened from the grain bin. And again, this focus, this demonstrates that you shouldn't focus on damage intensity alone when it comes to rating a damage or determining what caused the damage. And when it comes to tornado or downburst from the field survey, it can be hard uh, to determine the differences between the two. And starting with a, a radar and environmental data approach is really critical to getting in the mindset what possibly could have happened there. And you really need to hone in on the damage location. And if there is a TDS plume present, which I'll talk about in the next talk, expect there to be a tornado there somewhere although it probably may not have caused the worst damage sometimes sometimes it's the wind that causes the most damage right on the flanks of the tornado and not the tornado itself so those can be hard to find sometimes if you are looking for a tornado some tip-offs in the ground survey uh, narrow intense damage paths with tight gradients in the damage with the debris sometimes being pulled or twisted towards a center line are usually pretty good tip-offs that there's a tornado if you have fast moving tornadoes, you oftentimes may not see this. You'll just see kind of these narrow linear debris tracks and trees and crops are your best friend out there in the field. If you have those available to use to help figure out what the uh, winds were doing, they are really your best friend out there. That being said, you can also have inflow or downburst winds on the flanks of the tornado, especially the right flank, uh, which doesn't count towards the tornado width. And many times these tornadoes and downbursts coexist and Downbursts by themselves can be narrow and intense, especially if you have multiple downbursts meeting in the middle. And if you have a broad homogeneous damage area, try leveraging aerial data to try and figure things out. And this is a great example here on the right side 
where you have your tornado just starting to develop right here as it moves along. And you actually, if you look closely, you'll see these linear streaks in the field where you have downburst winds just coexisting right on the right flank of the tornado. And those actually caused most of the damage to these farmsteads up here. It wasn't the tornado path. You can see it actually moves off and kind of clips the farms here on the uh, on the north side. But the most of the damage here was from these linear winds and not the tornado itself. And oftentimes this is another great example of the uh, where you can have multiple wind patterns coexisting within a very short time uh, spatial scale. This is only about a half mile distance where you have your tornado track here uh, going here across the middle from southwest to northeast on the left side here. And then you can have, you can see these little areas of inflow winds here, but also on the right side, you can see a downburst. So if you were driving on a storm survey coming to the, from the east, you might encounter these downburst winds and think that's it. Uh, whereas the tornado was actually further down the road as well. So th these things can coexist in very close proximity with one another and make surveys very tricky. Here's just a view from the ground. I had a cornfield that I ran into on a survey once and looking at it, you could see that the uh, winds were kind of coming out of, I'm looking to the west here and the winds were coming out of the southwest, moving to the northeast. A very linear pattern in the debris field here but overall, um, wasn't we were trying to determine if it was a tornado or not. So thinking again that you might have these linear winds on the south side of the on the right flank of the tornado, went over to the north side of that track, and sure enough, the corn is actually all pointing to the south. So we could tell right from that example that we had a circulation sitting somewhere in that field that had moved through there. Uh, it was probably on the north side there. And it was very, very small, but overall, when we drew the actual track for the for the storm, we kept the winds separate. We had the tornado on the north side and then kept the winds and the inflow on the south side of there. So that's just an example of what you might encounter on a ground survey there uh, through, through in a cornfield. And these surveys can get really, really messy. Uh, this is just an example here from an HP supercell. Uh, multiple tornadoes, multiple wind swaths coexisting in very close proximity with one another. That uh, Eastern tornado, EF0 tornado track is probably one of the least confident tornadoes I've ever had to assign on a ground survey. The radar data didn't support it, but boy, they did have a nice little track and it kept going and going and going. Uh, so I and it was in the right spot if you had a cyclic supercell. So I kept it in there, but the radar data certainly didn't support it, but the ground survey did. It was a, it was a tough one for sure. When it comes to wind patterns with tornadoes, uh, you can have various different wind patterns depending on the size of the tornado and how fast it is moving. Some of the easiest ones are just purely convergent flow down a center line depending on where the tornado is moving. When you have fast moving tornadoes, that convergent pattern, especially on the north side, gets lost because of the translational speed of the tornado just wipes out that northern side of the circulation. So you get more of this debris orientation that's orthogonal of some way to the tornado center line, you can sometimes see some more complex circular patterns. This is kind of the precursor for a uh, multiple vortex tornado. And then with the multi-vortex tornadoes, you have these really intense, um, very small areas of convergent damage with more broader inflow and convergence signatures surrounding it. And the wind patterns around tornadoes are anything but uh, easy to uh, anything easy where well, are not are really complex sorry with a single cell tornado on the left side here with a translational speed of 30 miles an hour and a wind speed a uniform wind speed of 70 just the translational wind speed of translational component alone will cause a 60 mile an hour shift in the wind speed from the north to the south side of the tornado you throw in a multi vortex tornado and it can get really messy very quickly where you can have winds of you know, zero miles an hour here on the north side up to EF5 on the south side here, just when you stuck a vortex with the same properties as the main tornado and the same translational speed as it works around the actual cyclone itself. And the strongest winds for cyclonically rotating tornadoes are almost always on the south, on the right flank of the tornado. And it's again amplified by any, intent, any vortices there. And you can sometimes see these in the crop debris uh, fields where you can see these vortices working through here. This isn't actually ground scouring. What's happening here is you have debris being, being funneled, these old corn silage being pulled in and being 
um, highlighting these little debris swirls. It's actually not scouring dirt. It's just corn debris highlighting these complex wind patterns. And you can see most of these, these, in, these embedded vortices start near the tail of the tornado on the back flank, work along the right flank, and then dissipate on the front side. Occasionally, you see one complete the entire loop as the tornado moves through, but it seems like those are less common than those um, partial vortices that, dissip that form and dissipate before they make a complete rotation around the main tornado. The uh, EF scale is something we should hopefully all be familiar with by this point. It consists of 28 damage indicators ranging from small barns up to skyscrapers to trees. And each one of these damage indicators comes with a degree of damage. And from there, we can assign an EF rating. And one thing that we haven't done as much of, but it's becoming more common these days, is to assign the EFU rating uh, when you encounter a object that is hit by a tornado that is not covered in this list of 28 items. Uh, it used to be a lot of times we would just assign EF0, although there's a push going on now to just use EFU, which has always been there. It's just never been really utilized. The EF scale uh, has plenty of issues. I'm sure we're all familiar with some of these at least. Uh, one of the big ones is, is it really doesn't account for debris loading. I always like to say that a 60 mile an hour wind doesn't hurt nearly as bad as a car hitting you at 60 miles an hour. Uh, the wind residence time, you know, how long does the wind last at a given location? And how fast does the wind change? Does the structure have time to respond to that change in load? All of that is is very, very intricate and very much beyond the EF scale. Other things that may not account for are uh, the intense upward pressure gradient force within the tornado, uh, all structural integrity variables within a given structure. If you have sparse damage indicators, obviously you're gonna have a low EF rating most likely. And then this was of course highlighted by the El Reno tornado in 2013, the remote sensing measurement aspect. If you do happen to have a mobile radar nearby, how do you document that properly in the realm of the EF scale? And another big one is that a tornado is assigned the highest damage rating that is found. And it's oftentimes just a very, very small percentage of the overall tornado track. Very, very rarely is the highest rating the vast majority of the tornado track, especially for the EF2, 3, 4, and 5 type tornadoes. And when you're out on a damage survey, some of the most common damage indicators you're going to run into, especially for us rural offices, are farms, uh, residences, power lines, and trees. And other d damage indicators you're probably gonna run into at some point, uh, cars and farm equipment, crop damage, uh, fences, and uh, debris loading into uh, certain objects. All of those are some of the more common ones. And I had some notes accompanying each one based on my experience with them. With farms and outbuildings, the, the quality of construction with these really varies quite a bit. And the EF scale was primarily designed for larger solid wall buildings, not for small open air shelters. And when you encounter damage to one of these buildings, you would rate it ideally on lower on the EF scale when you see uh, that the equipment doors were open, which allowed the wind inside to pop the roof. Uh, older wood construction or rot with, or either subpar or sometimes even no connections to the ground. Or evidence that the structure was compromised by debris, such as maybe a tree falling on it. And sometimes it takes the collapse of just one wall of these buildings to completely cause it to collapse in on itself. So it's things like that you gotta really pay attention to and look at the surrounding damage indicators to see if it makes sense. When it comes to uh, family homes, one to two family homes, they're generally stronger than farm outbuildings, hopefully, with more stringent building codes. However, homes tend to fail in the same ways, where the wind gets underneath, the structure lifts the roof and the walls themselves then collapse. And when you're rating these on the on the on the EF scale, it's best to rate them on the lower end when you see that maybe the garage was the only part of the structure to fail, or the uh, the garage failed and took the whole roof with it, and that was all that caused the damage. If you see subpar or even no sill plate connections to the house, or with poor nail construction, large overhanging eaves, or again like with farms, like with uh, farm structures, if the house is compromised by other debris. And so we're gonna go through an example here using the Lawrence tornado last year, which was in my backyard, uh, to try and figure out what to rate this structure. <clears throat> and this is what we saw when we arrived here on the damage survey. This was obviously a one to two family house and looking at it on the uh, degree of damage chart here on the right-hand side, 
uh, looking through, you start with the EOD one and go keep going down the list until you find what the damage matches. And you come up with DOD nine, which is all walls collapsed for the house with a lower bound wind speed of 142 and an upper bound wind speed of 198 miles an hour. So straddling the EF3, EF4 range here. So the first thing you wanna look at is what does the surrounding damage look like, uh, especially up, right upstream and downstream of the house. And the tree damage primarily to the Southwest was roughly consistent with a strong EF1 tornado. However, we did notice that there was this one area just immediately to the southwest of the house where it looked like the trees suffered more substantial damage and maybe we had an enhanced wind swath like a mesovortex or a mesovortice move through there. Downstream, the tree damage was more akin to EF2, EF3 with just stubs remaining and debarking starting to be noticed here on the trees as well. This was actually a full healthy tree line right here and this is pretty much all that was left standing from it. Looking a little bit broader here at the houses to the north and to the south of that house, uh, primarily EF1 damage to the north and south, even sometimes EF0, this house to the, just to the southeast was just had some cosmetic shingle and roof damage. However, in the aerial, in the satellite data, it's a little tough to see here because of the resolution, but we did see these individual mesovortices along the south flank of the tornado. And if you backtrack them, they line up immediately with this house right here. So. The evidence was mounting that we were dealing again with a multiple vortex tornado that had a very narrow damage path um, right over that house. <clears throat> so then we get a little bit closer into the house itself and noticed that the bulk of the debris was actually sitting about 10 to 20 feet to the north of the house. So the house just didn't simply fall in on itself. It actually moved, the whole structure moved a little bit. And we couldn't really find the garage when we went out looking for the at this damage, you couldn't, I don't know if this garage is underneath the house or what, but we couldn't find the structure that was related to the garage itself. And then we went and looked at the uh, the roof rafter construction first, since that was on top, and the roof connections were very poor. Uh, poor nailing job, you can see some crude uh, two by fours used to held the roof rafters together. It was, it was pretty bad, no clips, no sign of any, uh, any reinforcing done nails there. It was single nailed connections. And when I was talking to uh, Ken Harding afterwards, as from a QRT standpoint, his words were gross. Uh, so, and then we went and looked a little bit lower at the house, at the foundation. And it was really odd because what we could tell, for what we could tell, the garage sill plates were bolted down with washers and nuts, but the house was not. Um, so that was a really much of a head scratcher there. So why was the garage bolted? And one possibility could be that the garage was built at a later time or by a different contractor. Uh, but definitely differences in construction noted there. I did not put the light bulb there. It was just lying there at that point. And then, you know, you could ask the hypothetical question, well, what if the uh, bolts that were on the, uh, on the, uh, were pulled off with the uh, house? And that would require, that would require a fairly serious failure of the bolt teeth themselves. And if you notice here, that's very pristine rust on that bolt. There is no sign of any sort of trauma to that bolt whatsoever, showing that there were nuts um, and um, washers on there that were holding it down. So that that didn't, we saw this on every single one that we found in the debris, they all looked the same. So that didn't show that we had anything on there to begin with. And then Looking at the garage too, to figure out what may have happened, we saw that there was actually some bolts missing on the back of the garage itself. There were supposed to be two more here on the back of the garage that just weren't there. Um, some, they had actually had a bolt bent out of concrete right there. That was just impressive to see um, right there. And some of the sill plates were yanked out with the bolts still sitting there. So very serious damage happened to this garage, although it's a garage, so it's, you know, take it at, at, at face value there. So when all of this was said and done, we spent about an hour at this house and you know, weighed all things together there, the, the signs of a metal, mesovortex, the questionable quality of the house construction, but the more um, rigorous construction of the garage, at least for its connections and the movement of the debris, we decided to rate it about a 150 to 160 mile an hour EF3, which was confirmed by the QRT when we sent it up to them just to make sure we weren't missing anything. So. That's just a quick example of how to go through and go through just a survey of one particular point. And again, it can take time and don't be afraid to take your time on some of those. Power lines, these can be tricky. 
uh, because power companies really like their power poles to be standing, not lying on the ground. So they get out there and replace them very, very fast. And it's very tough to infer what damage happened to a power pole uh, if they're already removed. So sometimes you get lucky and you can see the old ones laying on the ground. Um, you can sometimes infer that they had to replace poles based on looking for new poles or if there's fresh dirt. And this is just from personal experience that the rating curves for power poles seem on the high side. Uh, EF2 is expected for a snapped power pole, and it's rare that I see that surrounding damage matches that. Um, one possible reason is that the size and the quality of the wood varies quite a bit. Uh, maybe there's rot at the base that we don't see. Um, again, check the surrounding damage area to see if that makes sense. Um, it's just personally, I've seen that it seems high. Trees, we always seem to run into trees and it's the only damage indicator to really address a natural object. <laughs> it's really difficult to assign a wind speed to these, to especially an individual tree that the current EF scale hinges on. Uh, there's inconsistencies that exist with the current ratings, you know, uprooted versus snapped. It doesn't really seem to make much sense. The push right now is going to look at tree stands as a whole versus an individual tree. Um, there's some evidence that younger trees are more flexible than older trees. And there's a bunch of things to take into account. Uh, the health of the tree, the how strong the roots are, the soil conditions, and even the time of season all play a role in how the trees will respond to the winds of a tornado. So lots of things to take into consideration there. And it's something that the uh, new EF scale is actually trying to take into account. Uh, Non-damage indicators, there's all sorts of them. I just listed a few here. Automobiles, farm equipment, and crops tend to be the big ones. And the best practice nowadays is don't use it to assign, don't assign EF ratings to these damage indicators because it's simply something we don't know. You can use the damage to help nudge your, your surrounding valid damage indicators upwards or downwards. But for these particular damage points at this point, it's best not to do that and just assign an EFU point. That being said, there are improvements going on to the EF scale right now. You've probably heard of them every now and then. This process has been going on for the last three or four years. And some of the things that they're looking at, we're looking at here on the uh, new damage, new EF scale. Again, I talked about viewing trees as stands and talking about percentage of trees damaged versus just singular tree damage. Uh, there's scouring of, of uh, pavement or dirt. There's passenger vehicles possibly being thrown into there. Rural structures such as silos and irrigation systems are on the docket to be added. Uh, there's even pushes for how to use mobile data and remote sensing data to mobile radar data and remote sensing data um, as a part of the EF scale. And that stuff's still being worked on. Nothing has been finalized quite yet, but this is kind of the things that we're looking at. Also, for those of you who use the damage assessment toolkit, hopefully you know that there is an upgrade coming here because Flash is going bye-bye here in a very, very short time. It features a completely revamped mobile app and web interface that is built directly into Esri ArcGIS. Uh, some of the new features that it will support are multiple photos per point. Yay, I am very excited to see that because it, it beats having to go around a structure and take each individual picture of a certain point of the structure and then upload that as a new point. Uh, you can adjust your geolocation directly within the app, which is quite nice. In case your location isn't quite set, you can adjust it manually. They've also added tropical and flood events, and this is currently in a beta state, but it is being fielded very, very soon, probably either later this summer or early this fall, and there's more references there at the link at the bottom that you can use to, uh, to learn more about this. And when it comes to surveying, uh, as I hit on earlier, ground surveys are inher inherently limited by road access, and so transects are the way to maximize your work, your, your 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 survey results via roads and ideally you would have a tran uh, ef point at every time there's a big change in the ef scale or the edges of a tornado and you look at that and think oh my god i can't do that and quite frankly most of the time time constraints don't allow for that and that's okay but this is something to really strive for if you have the time and the equipment to do it this is the way to try and maximize those those road networks as best as possible Meanwhile, back at the office, shifting gears here, uh, hopefully you've assigned a public information officer at the same time as the survey team. And this person should be dedicated to the storm survey unless it's very small in scope. That person shouldn't be handling any other operational duties. And that person's gonna be responsible for all media inquiries, 
uh, communicating and communicating and aiding the survey teams, and then QCing the DAT data, constructing statements, social media graphics, web news stories, and anything else you might have. So again, you can see why having a dedicated person comes in handy. And for that person, time management is essential for getting this data out as fast as possible. As the survey team is heading out into the field, that person should be working on constructing, pre-filling the social media graphics with known information, the web story with known information, uh, filling in radar images and environment data, everything that you could possibly do beforehand. Because when the survey, da survey data comes in, it gets really hot and heavy pretty fast when it comes to getting that data out the door as well. As I said, the new the DAT has a new mobile app. It also has a new web page. You're going to be able to access it uh, with your NOAA login, just like Iris, and it's all Esri based. It replicates much of the legacy interface and functions as much as possible, but there are some new functions that come in handy. Uh, the one that I really like is adding external layers, and this is incredibly powerful. You can add different web services. You, and this is, includes multiple satellite imagery sources, aerial data sources. You can import KMLs from outside from, say, your EM sends you a KML file, the damage path. You can upload that into there and use that as an overlay. It has more robust data filtering, and you can cut and you can really customize some layers there. And it's just basically, e and also easier image capturing. And the one thing I want to point out uh, that we're struggling with with the new DAT is. The high-res satellite imagery that we ordered through USGS is currently not supported, um, and there's a risk that we may never get it back. Um, so if you are a user of that, uh, what's happened is it's still sitting on all the uh, workload is being done with NASA Sports still, and that contract expired several years ago now. Um, and they're just doing it for us because they're nice. And we really need to get a push going to get this move to the weather service side of the house and, and uh, really get this working. If you use that data, it's very, very handy. That being said, there's other satellite overlays we can possibly leverage. They're not quite as high resolution. Uh, these are still pretty much the gold standard for storm surveys. Uh, when it comes to releasing tornado information, the uh, PIO and the survey team should coordinate and exchange track stats at the end of each survey. Um, if there's enough time, the PIO should at least sketch a track line. And if there's enough time, to construct track polygons uh, for that tornado track. And once finalized, the data should be sent out as soon as possible. Don't wait for the survey team to complete all the tornadoes if there's more than one. Uh, send out each track as you get it in because that'll really save time later on as you're trying to get this data out the door. Uh, there may be some exceptions to that, especially for major events. Uh, coordinated press releases may be requested by our partners and we should be granting those as best as we can. And for damage that is EF4 or EF5 potentially, we need to have a virtual QRT member or members look at the data before it's certified and then consult with your WCM to, uh, to get these requests through. And it's acceptable at the day after a survey to say the damage is at least EF3 and then go with that and wait for us, wait for the QRT to, for, for feedback. And I talked about damage lines versus polygons. I'm a really big proponent of damage polygons because they just really tell so much more of a story of a tornado versus a simple line. Uh, the line suffers from many of the same, some of the same limitations as storm data. The biggest one being that it's a single EF rating for the whole line. You can't change it. Uh, so in this example, we have two tornadoes, an EF2 and an EF4. Um, overlaying the damage points from the actual damage survey helps to some degree, but it can still be misleading, especially for our partners and the public trying to look at this and make sense of what exactly we're trying to tell them uh, from the damage survey. And so when it comes to polygons, they, they really bring the survey to the next level. And it may be difficult to draw a polygon the first day after an event, and that's okay. You can start with a line, but you should strive to at least construct some sort of polygon in the days, weeks, or months after an event to really improve the historical record and improve our understanding of what happened out there. Uh, social media and news posts, uh, these should be common to us. Uh, we have our central region social media templates and web pages that we use to push out information as well. And then finally, coming towards the last few uh, slides here, my favorite parts, uh, virtual surveys and aerial surveys. What is a virtual survey? Uh, this has changed over the years. It used to be that you had to comb the news stories and the newspapers to figure out what may have happened. 
Uh, now we have social media and it's both a blessing and a curse uh, when it comes to trying to figure out what happened out there in the field and from all the information out there and plus our radar and environmental data, we try to figure out what the heck happened. And that that can be time consuming and you have to really do a lot of work there. One of the uh, one of the biggest things that you'll find that you'll have to do is tri triangulation, especially if you have no other data to work off of. And this is just an example of from one event uh, back in 2013 in Iowa, we had six tornadoes in a 45 minute time span. So we had lots of photos of multiple tornadoes on the ground at the same time. So we weren't surprised to see these pictures that I see here on the right hand side of these two tornadoes. But as we were working through the stats, and looking through the times of the tour of the photos, we quickly realized that that tornado on the right hand side wasn't accounted for. There wasn't a survey for that. It didn't match any of the other ones. We we had we had a mystery tornado on our hands. And so we spent a long time, maybe several days, trying to figure out the exact location of all the photographers, where they were looking, and you know, we look at the photos, you look at the shelter belt orientation, the type of road, the power lines, all that information you go into Google Earth and you start digging for where that photographer may have been. And when all that was said and done, we found we had six different photos and videos looking at this sucker and we triangulated them all to this one spot right here that we didn't have any survey points for. So even when we got the satellite data, there was no track there, but we knew with pretty strong certainty that there was a tornado there. And so we marked one in the database for that. Some of the best practices when it comes to virtual surveys is Make sure if you can get image timestamps, they are so nice to have, especially some of the more modern storm chasers have timestamps directly embedded in their videos, it's very nice. Uh, don't be afraid to ask for more information and tornado distances and photos can often get exaggerated either from the wide angle lenses of a camera phone or zoom lenses from more um, advanced cameras. Uh, look at other features of the storm and that might actually give you clues as to where as the timing of the tornado and even the sun angle can help a lot to help determine where the viewer is looking as well aerial surveys uh, there's two main platforms these days to get aerial data the first is via satellites which so there are satellites in uh, unmanned aerial vehicles and they both have their pros and cons uh, satellites cover large areas with high detail and their data is immediately gis ready but they're very much dependent on the cloud and satellite availability, and it can take weeks or even a month to get the data sometimes. With UAVs, you got fine detail in real time, but it can be very weather dependent, limited battery life, and there's also, of course, training and privacy issues that, that follow. Uh, some of the satellite data sources that we can have at our disposable, satellite and aerial. Uh, the one on the left is the USGS emergency satellite support that I kind of alluded to earlier that we order and then can hopefully in the future again view in the DAT. Uh, it relies on the are targeted requests with very high resolution. We're talking less than a meter in most places and they're indefinitely archived on the USGS server. You have the Sentinel-2 Landsat-8 satellite pairs which have near daily coverage across uh, across the CONUS in some way or another. The resolution is a lot more coarse. We're talking maybe 10 to 15 meters, but they can help reveal broad track and wind structures. They're not gonna resolve your structural details, but you can still sometimes find tornado tracks within them. Uh, they, some, they come in multiple channels. They, the satellites have between nine and 12 channels. So you can create your own custom RGBs to see if you can reveal the data um, more appropriately. This data is actually available in the DAT as one of those overlays I talked about. And you can also view it on various websites. One of my favorites is called the EO browser. And I have the link down there. It's a third party site, but it's very, very powerful for looking at this data. Uh, you have the, moving on, you have the National Agricultural Imagery Program or the NAEP. And those photos are only taken about once a year across the CONUS. And it actually varies by state. Some states only have one every other year or so. And the data is usually only available at the beginning of each year. Uh, the resolution is pretty good. It's about one meter. You can certainly reveal uh, damage patterns and building damage. This data is also available in the DAT, thankfully. And there's a historical archive going back for many years that you can tap into if you're interested in a certain event. All that is there. And then finally, Google Earth. Um, amazing program, a very, very high resolution data. We're talking probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 5 to 10 centimeter right now with its current imagery. 
But whether or not it actually covers the tornado is very much in the air. Um, sometimes some areas get sampled more than one time a year. Some areas haven't been sampled in the last five years. Uh, but it has a historical imagery archive built into the program, which is very, very nice. And that imagery is kept up to date. So it's very, very handy. Uh, when it comes to the wind fields, what you might see in aerial data, uh, I talked about this earlier with the different uh, types of tornado motion and sizes. Here's an example on the upper left of a fast moving tornado. You can see that the track is from the southwest to the northeast with a kind of a north to south orientation in the actual wind, wind scours there. You have your more classic narrow convergent and they get path here on the upper right. And then as you get more and broader, uh, broader tornadoes, you can see the multi-vortex pattern start to materialize as well. I really like how you can see here on the right side, how the vortex just starts to form here on the top and then works its way down to the uh, to the southeast. Pretty, pretty neat stuff. Here's an example of, of downbursts. This is actually the same derecho event that I showed earlier that had that grain bin being drugged through the field. It wasn't the only one that got drugged through the field. And this is an example of all sorts of bins being drugged through fields for sometimes miles during this derecho. But in this example, you don't see any tight gradations in damage intensity and even possibly a slight divergent orientation there in the debris. And here's an example from Google Earth, another downburst. This one isn't quite as obvious here. It's a more broader picture. Uh, the crops are mature and dying and sometimes harvested. If you look closely, you'll see actually some linear tracers going from northwest to south here, east in the bottom half of the image. But then you'll see actually they reverse and go from southwest to northeast on the upper right-hand image of the, Im of the, uh, of the uh, photo as well. And this downburst caused widespread tree damage in town as well. But again, showing how the linear streaks in the fields are really what drove, are really what are visible there. And it can get messy again. A uh, tornado sometimes transitions to downburst. This is an example here from Eastern Iowa. We start off here. Uh, this is a pretty cut and dry tornado path right here uh, from a QLCS. As we go forward in time though, you'll notice you'll start to see some winds, the uh, some downburst winds develop on the right flank of the tornado. The circulation seems to be getting a little more disrupted there. As we move just another mile or so to the north, you'll suddenly see the pattern gets a whole lot messier and you'll see these you can see this broad cyclonic wind streaks in the field, but you'll see a lot more linearity to the wind field itself as we move further and further to the northeast. And finally, moving further up, you'll see the tornado itself is beginning to really fall apart if there is even a tornado there at all. Um, just more linear wind, and finally at the end, it's almost entirely linear wind. And this happened over the course of about five to six miles. So very, very quick change. Uh, tips for aerial surveys, uh, some degree of cleanup is always likely prior to the acquisition of aerial data. So pre-event imagery is very helpful in locating trees and structures that have already been cleaned up. And as I said earlier, fields are your best friend for locating, uh, especially corn and soybean fields are your best friend for locating damaged tracks. But beware of natural or human features that may actually look like a tornado track. I've been caught with these before. Uh, stream beds, ridge lines. This example here on the right-hand side is actually just a ridge line in the satellite Im in satellite imagery. Uh, farm equipment trails, all that can really uh, fool you into thinking there's a tornado track there when it isn't. And the aerial data can be kind of scary. You may see some really short-lived spin-ups, and the question becomes, are they actually tornadoes? Um, that is something we've had to deal with as well. The type of crop can can influence the what you see in the track, and this is a really great example of a tornado coming from southwest to northeast. It's going first through a soybean field, so you just see the very inner core of the tornado, and then suddenly it hits the cornfield, and there's a broad, lot broader of a damage path there to see there. You can still see the intense uh, damage path there of the tornado in the middle, but you suddenly have this more broader damage on the edges from the corn as well. And tornadoes can disappear into different fields. In this example, this is a corn field on the left and a soybean field on the right. And you really can't even see this tornado track in the soybean field at all. And the question has been raised, can you rate tornado damage from the air? Um, I won't say it can't be done, but it's really hard, especially because aerial satellite data especially only renders a 2D rendering of the structures that are impacted and you really need a thorough three-dimensional ground survey to do it. This is an example of one track I actually did do completely from the air and it did a pretty good job matching the ground track, but I had high res data 
and a really nice clustering of damage indicators to make this, this work. And then finally, wrapping up here with unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, current weather service policy doesn't allow us to fly them on official surveys, although there is a pilot program being underdone, uh, especially on the East Coast with several FOs. The weather service can't explicitly ask UAVs to fly their units, but we can mention the usage of UAVs in any blanket statements we send out for requests for damage photos. And of course, we are allowed to accept and utilize any unsolicited data from our partners and the public and even weather service employees on non-government time and not identified as weather service employees. And that's an example of my drone there on the uh, on the right hand side there. So that wraps up talk one of two. I don't know if you wanted to stop for any questions there, Randy, before moving on to number number two. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Great 